Again, welcome everybody. We're getting started in just a minute. Go ahead and introduce yourself if you haven't already. And Dee, do you want to say hi to everybody while we're getting started? Uh, sure. Um, I'm Dee Fink. Uh, you all know my name, I guess, by now and some of the things I've done. Uh, I worked uh, for, got my graduate degree at the University of Chicago. And while there, I was working on the teaching of geography in higher education. And that's what kind of got me set up for what I did later after I came uh, to the University of Oklahoma for my first and only academic job for my whole career, but uh, started the instructional development program here where I worked with faculty uh, across the whole campus to uh, uh, find ways to improve their teaching, those who were interested and ready to do that. And, uh, and so it, uh, we had a lot of a lot of fun activities. Some of them were one-on-one -on -one consulting. Some of them we had a lot of some a good number of uh, kind of biweekly group meetings that were that were a lot of fun to work with, and uh, and uh, did that until I retired from Oklahoma in 2005. I am Bridget Arend. Um, I have the pleasure of getting to work with DeFink um, both when I used to run a center for teaching and learning at the University of Denver. We had him come visit our campus like a lot of you probably have done and it was incredibly popular one of the most popular things we did um, people really enjoyed his version of course redesign focusing on meaningful significant learning um, and so i have had the pleasure of being able to work with him over the last couple of years and offer online courses based on the integrated course design framework and the and the um, taxonomy of sig significant learning so Really excited to do that work and share some of DeFink's brilliance with you all today. This is pitched to be a very informal conversation. We definitely have a little bit bigger group than we typically do in these conversations, and I'll share more about that in a second. But just some housekeeping items. Um, because this is really set up as an informal webinar, um, really more of a meeting, if you know kind of the Zoom technology um, norms. So all of you have the capability to unmute and talk at any time, but we ask you to keep your microphone muted for now. I'm going to start off asking Dee some questions that are just a little bit more of the common things that people are asking around significant learning and the course design process. And then we'll have some questions. I'm going to maybe pick out those of you that are in our significant learning by design two course right now who have sent in questions to have your questions addressed. And then we'll also open it up to questions from the group, and some of you have sent in questions earlier, which I'll be able to get at as well. Um, you are certainly welcome to put questions in the chat. We will do our best to get to those, but I will fully admit that um, we might not get to all of those um, and be as attentive to that during this session. Um, but I wanted to also, like I said, just, just do the housekeeping pieces, give you an idea of what's to come, and also can't help but share with you that we are basing this discussion for folks who have been in our significant learning by design courses, but a lot of you that were invited to this session have not. Um, either you have in the past or maybe you're familiar with DFINC's work in other ways. But what we'll be talking about are some issues related to course design and specifically integrated course design and the taxonomy of significant learning. And those are the courses that we offer that are based on DFINC's work. We have significant learning by design one and two. And the first course is really based on designing what we call the three column table, where you go through a backward design process and you really outline your learning outcomes based on the taxonomy of significant learning. You also then think about your assessments, how you will get evidence of those learning goals happening. And then you look at the different kinds of activities that you would use to have those things um, be most likely to happen for your students. What kinds of things would students need to do in order to be successful with your learning outcomes? And then the Significant Learning by Design 2 course takes it to the next step where you actually build out your course. You, you take that Significant Learning goal and you put it into weekly um, learning outcomes. We talk about things like grading. We talk about inclusive design principles. We talk about designing the syllabus, all those different kind of tangible elements. Um, and then I also just wanted to share before we jump into this that that our organization also has other courses that you may or may not know about and may or may not be interested in, but they are all different and unique in their own way and really 
kind of uniquely um, successful in terms of what they can do. They're all based on a base a two and a half to three week online course format where you either get in and design some activities for teaching students how to learn or advancing equity based online teaching or we also have one around designing a motivational syllabus and I know a few names out there in our group today some of you have taken a few of these courses but just wanted to share those those are all on our website if those are of interest for you as we go forth. So, like I said, I'm still kind of admitting people as they come in, but I'm going to go ahead and turn that off and we can share some thoughts with Fink as we go forward, but I'm going to try to highlight his video here for us today. And that way we can get some, some questions and ideas from him. And I think on your end, you possibly have the idea to kind of adjust your settings where you can see everybody or you can just see D or the two of us. So do whatever makes the most sense for you. But like I said, I'll start off with some general questions and then we'll, we'll move it over to questions from our participants and our group. Um, but first of all, this is actually a question that has come in from some of the folks that are participating in today's session, but relates to a lot of things that that often are talked about um, by participants in our courses. So one of the, the questions that comes in is the idea around the practical applications of significant learning. So the taxonomy of significant learning, which we're not really going to review today. Um, I certainly could drop something in the chat that will have some some additional resources for that taxonomy if you're not um, familiar with it, but we're, this question is around the practical application. So how do we help instructors see the value of things like caring and of these other things that go beyond their content knowledge? So Dee, I'm just going to go ahead and throw that out to you. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you to Bridget for inviting me to visit with all of you, but also thank you to all of you for joining in here. It's, uh, it, it's always wonderful to see a group of faculty who are willing to spend time to learn about teaching and learn how to improve their teaching. And that's exactly what you all are. So thank you. On behalf of somebody who cares about higher education, thank you for that, because that's what it's going to take to make higher education all that it can be and, and needs to be. Um, a little bit of background on this, on, on how these things developed. I, I was working here as a, a faculty developer at the University of Oklahoma. and. Um, and, and realized that a lot of the people, when I said, let's, let's uh, plan your course, not around topics, uh, which is a very common way of doing that. Topic one, you know, maybe from the textbook, topic one, topic two, topic three, and you work your way through the, the, the table of contents of the textbook. They're, 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 try to convince them there's a better way of putting a course together that will result in what I think most professors really want if they stop and think about it, and that is they want students to learn something in their course that the students will see has long-term and personal value to them, either in their personal life or their business operations or, or whatever. And uh, so how to do that, how to, how to build a course that has that kind of impact beyond just short-term memory. And that's where I think these two concepts of the, the taxonomy of significant learning can uh, can give us what some of those possible uh, learning outcomes might be that would impact a wide variety of students in a wide variety of ways, but also in the model of integrated course design, which uh, gives us a, some ideas on how to uh, take those, those learning goals and build them in the course and identify the right learning activities and assessment activities so that by the time the course is over, the students really get it and understand it and understand how to use it. So that was, that was the, uh, the, the, the feeling that uh, prompted me to, to uh, inter, uh, push for some of these things. And uh, uh, that's, what, that's what got it out there. So I'll, I'll hold it there and uh, maybe move from that sort of general comment to uh, your questions about either the taxonomy or the model of integrated course design. Thanks, Dee. And somewhat of a perhaps related question too, and you might wanna just share for just a second or two the idea of the big dream but that is definitely oh yeah yeah that was something is interesting I, I didn't start out with that but i was just uh, going around the country doing some of these workshops on different campuses and uh in, in the middle of one of those i just i was i was sort of trying to help one professor drill down to see what her major learning goals were and as i was pushing her and pushing her about that i came up with this well what's your big dream for your students 
And she was a person who was in the theater department and it really stopped her for a minute. I mean, she really had to, it took a while. We were all sitting there in silence waiting for her to figure this out. And finally she said, I wanna teach students how to act. And that was that kind of big, all encompassing. That was her, the, the set on top of things. And then, but to get that to happen, then that's where you bring in the taxonomy and whatever, start well for them to learn how to act effectively what are the various specific things they need to learn that would allow them to do that? And so that's, that was really that, that idea of the big dream. It seemed like it was so useful to, uh, if you can identify that for your course, uh, to th then help you let that guide you in identifying more specific learning goals that you can build into the course in a fairly knowing way. So yeah, that was, that was kind of an interesting moment. But uh, as soon as that came out, I realized that was not just something that was useful for her, that was something that was useful for all of us who were trying to, to put our courses together in a powerful way for students, to figure out what our big dream is, and then maybe encourage students to think about what their big dream is for the course. That is, what is it they think they might learn from our course that would have major value for them. And I can speak from experience and say that I think the big dream is one of those really incredibly um, sometimes even transformational steps that people will go through where they they will often see, you know, I just want them, the content's going to change, the skills they use are going to change over time, but I want them to be a lifelong learner. I want them to always be using evidence-based practices, or I always want them to to see the, the complexity of this field, but be able to move forward. And when you have that as your guidepost, if you will, yeah. you're yeah. really able to adjust and change and and design things that help get to that more so than if we're just focused on the content yeah yeah so one of the questions that often comes in around the big dream is this sense that when people are really dreaming big they will very often say well these these dreams i have for students are more about the program or graduating college mm -hmm. you know when you say i want somebody to be a lifelong learner that's a wonderful big dream but sometimes it's hard to then think about, am I dreaming for the course or for the entire program? Or how do I, how do I get this focused on what I can do in my particular course? Yeah, uh, well, it, it's good to keep the program in mind, but I, I think with a little practice and work, you will get the hang of how to do it for your particular course. Uh, let me give you an example uh, of how I did that for mine. I was teaching, I had taught a course for many years in the geography department here at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, on regional geography. And that, that was a course that I, I really had my main job as a faculty developer, but I wanted to stay active in the classroom. And that, that was a course that fit me well uh, because I had been in the Peace Corps and had been overseas and you know, two years in one country and then had the incredible opportunity to, to join some other people and travel through Africa, the Middle East and Asia for a whole year. So we, we, got, to, we got to see regions. And I, so I knew from personal experience what that meant and the potential value it, it had. So part of my, uh, my challenge was to figure out how to take that concept of regional geography and say, uh, help students find a way to find, make that, find out what the meaning of that was for their own personal experiences. And, and I think what, what I found myself working towards is says either in their personal life or the business life, um, what are the places that you will be important to you in doing things? Uh, and what is it you need to know about those places that will feed into your, uh, your personal uh, agenda for that or your business agenda? And then how do you gather that information? And so that's, that's what the, the geography course became was uh, what, is it, what are the things you can know about places and then how to pick out various of those and then find information about those that you might want to use in your future personal and professional life. Uh, so that's, that's the way I made that transition for a particular course uh, to have it feed into the, the dream, the, well, the work of those students. But my big dream was they will, they will know how to find information that's significant for their personal and or professional lives. So that brought it right down to that particular course. Great, thank you. And I think, you know, I often give people feedback too that if the dream is so big that it's hard to do in one course, that's good. And that that means you're dreaming really big <laughs> because sometimes it's, yeah, yeah. it's sometimes it is difficult for us to think about those bigger goals that go beyond the impact that we want to have on students' lives. So I always say this is a good problem. And, you know, what is that small piece perhaps that we could impact that would affect that long term, but that we could actually control for in this one course? 
uh, we probably don't want to spend the whole time on this, but it might be worth doing if somebody here was really struggling to figure out what their big dream was for their course. Uh, Once you yeah, let's raise it up here and let's uh, we'll talk it through to see if we do it. And the value of that for everybody else might be you'll see the kind of questions you need to ask when you're trying to figure out what your big dream might be. So if anybody wants to volunteer a course where they're struggling to find that, uh, we, we could play with that for a little bit. Well, I did see, I think Kirsten Helmer just put a question in the chat. And if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and share this question, yeah. I think that relates to our... I see that too. Yeah. Um, Kirsten, do you want to join in and share real quick? Well, I don't have a particular course in mind, so I also work as a faculty developer with the Center for Teaching and Learning at UMass Amherst. And I mean, we we know that some courses, it seems easier, you know, to, to think in terms of uh, how is this relevant for our students personally, professionally, but then there are certain courses some have termed them and i mean i i don't uh like those terms like more remedial courses for example so students are kind of forced to take them right so mm -hmm. how do you really uh yeah bring this notion of the the dream and the relevance into those courses beyond you need to take it to be brought up to speed or even we see it sometimes with the uh, general education courses, right? That students feel mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm just taking this course because I, I have to f fulfill certain requirements. Yeah, there's a list here and I got to take five of them <laughs> or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, uh, but I think, yeah, those especially required courses, sometimes uh, students come into those courses with a little bit of a negative attitude, not always, but sometimes that uh, I'm here be only, be only because I got to take it. They, they're making me, and so I don't, I'm not here because I already have any sense of the value of it. And when you have a course like that, I think what it requires is you spend, the teacher spend a little time during the first week or two, uh, maybe longer, but especially then to build some links between uh, what you're gonna do in that course and students' future personal and professional lives. You have to think about what that might be and then how, what it, beyond just teacher talk. I mean, you can talk about it, but the more you can get students doing things, uh, field experiences, field trips, visiting people, bringing visitors in, some way or another, <clears throat> helping them see what the connections might be between what you're gonna be studying in this course and again, their, their future personal and professional lives. Uh, help them see those at least potential connections and then help them build them as they go through the course. I don't know how much that helps, but uh, is any, has anybody else uh, struggled with that, but had some success that they might want to share uh, their course and what they did with that in terms of helping students uh, uh, see value in courses that they're required to take and maybe don't see the value of it themselves? Just volunteer out. Or if you didn't have one where you solved the problem, you if you're still facing it, uh, go ahead and put it out here and we'll play with it. Yeah. Either way. Hi, uh, my name is Sara Master Lahian, and I am an, uh, a faculty developer at University of Iowa. Um, so what we have done and we have talked to our faculty about, and it has seemed to be very useful, is that um, we think about the ways that we want to communicate the course dreams with the students. Um, mm -hmm. There are many different ways to do that. And in order to also make it a more inclusive um, experience for the students, uh, basically we always talk about that to be less transactional, to just tell the students what our dreams as the instructors are for the, for the course, but also have a dialogue with the students to say, or just encourage them to reflect on what they think they will get out of that. The other thing that is a kind of complementary to this communication of the course dreams or goals for the course um, is that we try to also encourage faculty to incorporate transparent design in their courses that all the time talks about the purpose, the okay, transparent, assignment, what? That again? transparent assignment design from the Transparency in Learning and Teaching Project. 
um, that it, it really starts all the time with purpose. And we encourage the faculty to link whatever that the students are doing throughout the semester in terms of assignments, tasks, activities, to the goals that they have they have talked about at the very beginning of the course. So they all the time are revisiting that goal to see that what it really looks like in terms of their professional development. Good advice, good advice, yeah. In other words, highlight at the beginning and, and keep reiterating it with particular assignments. Not only here's what the assignment is, but here's why we're doing this. And, and then and in answering that, why are we doing this? Uh, link it as much as you possibly can to possible personal goals they might have, or let them start sharing some with each other. Because a lot of times, if we can get students dialoguing as a whole class, one student will say something, well, I, I see this link, and another student will say, oh, I, I hadn't thought of that, but that could have that value for me too. And uh, so having that dialogue can be beneficial for the whole class. Yeah. And I love that idea too of having the students put it in their own words or you yeah. know, sharing this dream you have with your students and having them, yeah, I've, I often do that in courses, here's the course outcomes, but rewrite these in terms of what would make sense for you and your career and where you are and, yeah. and take ownership. And then um, share that with the rest of the class, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then kind of moving on to other aspects of the design process. I know the taxonomy of significant learning has these various components to it. And Gina, I think you are here and I don't mean to call you out, but you sent in a question earlier. I know you're going through SLD2 and asked about, is the aim to have equal proportion of all types of learning in each course? So would you wanna give a little more context on that and share that question? Sure. So um, I'm in the occupational therapy department uh, at Dominican University of California, and we're in the process of redesigning our curriculum. And so as we've been and we decided that we wanted to use the think taxonomy um, as a guiding principle. And so as we've been going through the different courses, uh, you know, we're looking at how can we pull in these different aspects of significant learning. And then we started creating what we called the think pie for each class and what percentage is it of this and what percentage of it. So we were really like deconstructing it. And, and I wasn't sure. I was like, well, I don't know if, if it makes sense to have a class that's, you know, mostly foundational. I think the, the purpose is that in every learning experience, we're trying to, to hit all six of those but that began to feel unrealistic, you know, when they're learning more foundational knowledge and, you know, kinesiology versus towards the end of the curriculum when they're learning, um, you know, seems to be more application based. So I just wasn't sure how to, how to weave that or the expectation of balancing all six of those throughout, you know, yeah. an activity, a class and a curriculum. My own sense is that it uh, <clears throat> that most people, when they start this process, will feel like what you described that that you you need the uh, the lower levels and the foundational courses and the higher levels not until you get until the upper division courses or whatever, and and my my view would be to be cautious about that. I think you if with a little creative thinking you can find application type activities and goals even in your intro courses. And the, uh, you, you, they may be lighter than some of your later courses, but the degree to which you can uh, make those an explicit part of those courses, the easier it's going to be for students to see the value of those courses and engage the energy in them. So I, I, my goal, my sense is to, to the degree that you can, try to get the, the, the full set of the taxonomy in all courses, introductory as well as uh, the advanced courses. And, uh, and even in the advanced courses, you are working on applying oftentimes, but usually there's some new material being introduced there to the students. So again, you've got the you've got the introductory material as well as the application of it. And so, uh, so I think if to the degree you can, it it theoretically does apply the whole the whole taxonomy all the way through from beginning to end. Uh, emphasis may vary, but uh, you want some of that just so they know what it begins to look like. But they begin to know what it looks like. The application part and the value part and what connections they might want to make with it. Thank you. So just kind of moving, we seem to be chronologically moving through your integrated course design process, but there were other questions that came in and this is something that often 
emerges in the, the courses I've done, the, the focus in the three column table goes from learning outcomes to assessments and then to activities. And a lot of times there's some blurred lines between assessments and activities. And right. there's usually some questions that come up around, what's the difference? Is it okay to duplicate? Do I need to have separate things? How do you differentiate those two? And why do we have assessment come first even? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, let me take two of those questions then remind me if I have forgotten some of the others. But uh, one, one thing is uh, assessment activities and learning activities. Uh, are they the same or different? And, and uh, what I eventually realized after working with this, and I didn't have this realization when I first started was sometimes, not always, but sometimes assessment activities and learning activities will be identical. That is the same activity that allows students to learn it also gives you and them information to determine how well they have learned. I mean, it's just inherent in the nature of the activity. Not always the case, but sometimes. So if you if you find that be looking as you try to write a learning activity and assessment activity, if they look pretty similar, don't worry about it. That's okay. Sometimes they either are identical or at least similar, and so that's that's par for the course. Other times they'll be fairly different, but uh, but if it's the same or similar, uh, sometimes that's okay. Yes, and I'd say, I think, you know, especially as we move more and more towards active learning types of activities, what we really are doing are we're getting evidence of learning as we're having them practice the learning and do the things so that I think that's okay to have that that blurred line a lot as that's well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions I wanted to get to before we start getting more questions from the group, because um, sometimes people ask about the idea of the integrated nature of course design, like what makes it integrated and in the courses we talk about functional integration, which is more of the do the alignment between the goals and the activities and the assignments, but then there's also this kind of chronological integration in terms of how things build over time. So could you speak to that a little bit, the, the idea of why it's called integrated course design? Yeah. Uh, what I saw a lot of uh, when I started working in the field of, of faculty development here, uh, that is when people were just on their own without input from some specialists like that, is they put together courses where uh, oftentimes there, there weren't even, there weren't any learning goals. They just worked through the content. And sometimes that content was of their own makings. So oftentimes it was uh, kind of followed the table of contents in a, in a major textbook for the course. Uh, and so they would introduce some content and then they would, uh, long, well, let's say I better, I better assess this somehow, I gotta give a grade. So they put two midterms and a final in there, maybe some weekly quizzes along the way. Uh, so they'd have some basis for giving a grade. But to me, what that usually resulted in was just was it was was an uncoordinated, unintegrated, just a, a set of learning activities and a disconnected set of assessment activities and, and a non-existent set of learning goals. Um, and, and so for the students, it resulted in a learning experience that was disconnected, not integrated, uh, certainly with each other, let alone with any purposes they might have. So why do I need to learn this? What's the value of it for me? There's no attention given to that. Maybe it might become a little bit apparent for some of the students, but I think for a lot of them, it never did. It just a course I had to take. Here was what the teacher required of me, and here's what I had to do to get a grade or a good grade. And to me, that's that's wasting a major learning opportunity that that we want students to have. And uh, so if we want to avoid that kind of uh, learn it and forget it kind of response by the students, uh, then we have to start thinking about, well, what, what kind of goals can we put in and how can we build the right kind of ac learning activities and assessment activities for it? And once we do that and make that visible to students and make the, the, the connections between those, your purposes and their purposes and how that might connect with their life in the near or distant future, the more value they're going to see in it and the more energy they're going to be able to put into it, be willing to put into it. So I think uh, learning how to get those connected, all of them, but you have to start with the learning goals because that should drive the selection of the learning activities and assessment activities. And again, sometimes those assessment and learning activities will be either similar or identical, and that's okay. Uh, I don't know how, is, is there additional parts of that question that I can address or is that, that address it fully enough? 
I know I think that is good. I still, you know, vividly remember again when you visited our campus and you talked about how also just kind of the, the nature of building on material mm -hmm. throughout the course that you can't just take week three and week 12 and swap those that you know, week <laughs> yeah. 12, yeah. we should be doing something very fundamentally if, different. If, if you're doing, if you can swap them, your course isn't set up in a way that builds and, and, and mm -hmm. becomes more exciting as you go through it. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's maybe the, the acid test. Can you swap, swap weeks without any effect? And if so, you want to rethink your course. Then. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a little bit of a, a mind-blowing message for a lot of folks in terms of, yeah. oh, that is, you know, it's not just the content, it's these yeah. ongoing. In, in some random sequence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and we did, and I want to, again, kind of open it up more to questions that you have, and I have a list here, but we'll get to what is most useful for the group here. Um, but Curtis, you just sent in a question about convincing colleagues to switch from Finks to Blooms. And again, if you want to add any more context to that, please go ahead and jump in. Um, I, I, it was just sort of an off the cuff question, but um, so uh, I, D, I, uh, I think I, uh, I went to a workshop of yours. I think it was at the University of Minnesota, but we might have flown out to it once. So, um, so I was excited to see this webinar and just kind of get inspired again by your taxonomy. So the, the I work um, at a place that does all online learning, and we use Bloom's taxonomy a lot. So I was just kind of thinking, as I was listening to this, how do I get this group to adopt, you know, yeah. what are the big selling points um, yeah. for a change for a big change in practice? But I was thinking, gosh, I wish we we had like the metacognitive stuff built into our lessons and the stuff about caring and human values. So I'll hang up and listen. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, Bloom is you know I I, I think I've, you probably know this. I may have mentioned some of my workshops here, but. You know, I, my graduate work was at the University of Chicago, and I had course I had a course from Bloom, not about the taxonomy, but one about course design. I think it was, uh, but I was very very familiar with him, and it really is a good I thought start having that cognitive framework, and, and of course it, it's had wide worldwide uh, adoption and use, so it's clearly has a lot of people see the value in it. But having looked at it, and but then then looking at well, what is it I really want students to learn? Clearly, a lot of what I wanted to learn was cognitive. It fit into the Bloom taxonomy easily. But there were other things as well that I thought were important that just didn't fit into that. And so I started playing with that and say, well, what are those other things? Let's try to list them out. And then eventually realized I could begin to sort those into you know, a handful of categories. And then, uh, and then eventually came out with my own taxonomy, which, which incorporates Bloom, but then goes beyond it, I think, in some important ways, at least ways that I found it. Uh, in the human dimension and caring and things like that, interacting with other people and, and learning to care, that, that just doesn't go into the Bloom taxonomy. And to me, they're really important. Uh, and I think they are for most people when they stop and ask themselves seriously whether they might be important for them. So that's, that's what prompted me to sort of move into this other, you know, what I saw as a broader taxonomy and, uh, and hope that other people would see some value in it too. Is there, does that address your comments, or do you want to you want to follow up with some comments about how what that did for you? No, thanks. Uh, that and the the link from Bridget are, are very helpful. So thanks. Great. Glad that, glad that worked out. Yes, I was trying to pop some resources in the chat as we go through, but I think a related question that came in um, through the registrations for this session was also about administrators and helping see administration to see the value, not only of spending time on course design, but of this also kind of more holistic view of learning. So I know you've worked with administrators too, if you have any tips or advice on that realm. Yeah, that, that's an important one, because uh, if we can help the, uh, the administrators become allies in our effort to uh, work with faculty and convince faculty that uh, they want their courses to be more than just content-centered and content-focused, uh, that will make a major difference in our ability to, to get faculty on board with this. Uh, so how to help administrators? I, I think the key probably is to look at uh, linking courses to program because uh, the, the administrators see programs. I mean, they, they're aware of courses that, that support those programs, but they're 
if we can help them see to, to get these program goals and your departmental goals and, and the goals for your majors in your course, uh, if you really want those to, if you should have goals, I mean, uh, explicit, give some thought to by the end of this program, what do we want our majors to know and be able to do? Uh, and as you start to answer that, you will be developing learning, desired learning outcomes in my current language. And, uh, and then if, if, and then what language can you use to formulate those in a, in a good way that's both uh, convincing to students, convincing to faculty, but then also maybe sheds a little light on what you need to do in individual courses or in the set of courses to get those to happen to each student by the end of the program. Uh, what you're basically doing is kind of a curriculum planning via courses, via desired learning outcomes. And uh, so they, to me, those kind of all fit together. And, uh, but, but those are things that administrators can see the value of pretty quickly, I think. And I think, Sarah, you had a question? Yes, sure. Thank you, Bridget. Um, I um, actually have two questions, but the first one is that um, so we in our course design institutes and everything that is related to course design discourse, uh, we definitely rely on and introduce uh, backward course design. And one of the questions, uh, because we really see that as um, a very learner centered and learning centered process and framework for the students. But one of the questions or one of the conversations that we've had and we've also got is that to what extent, because we know that it's very learner centered, but because it starts with the instructor, I mean, the instructor thinks about the goals and then designs the objectives or outcomes and then thinks about the other parts of the course, how, what is the, what is the boundary between its being learner centered and behavioral perspective? That was one of the questions that I needed more time to think about and respect. How it is not something that is very, very much inspired by a behavioristic perspective that we are, we are thinking about how students should do or what they need to do. And then how is students, learners situated in this framework? I don't know if I asked that in a clear way, but for me, that was something that I'm very much appreciating this time to also mention and also see what you think about it. Well, let me let me start with a little bit and then you tell me if if we need to talk about this more. I, I sort of halfway understand it, but let me see if I if I do properly or not. Uh, what I'm hearing is is uh, if you buy if a teacher buys into the idea that a course ought to be learning centered, uh, fair enough, but then he also has to deal with uh, student reactions, student behavior, student uh, activities and and then link those to those desired learning outcomes uh, and then work about how do I get the right behavior and, and students to engage in learning about this kind of learning as opposed to something else or nothing at all. Is, is that sort of where your question is going? Or clarify yes, for me if it is? Yes, one, one of the questions and then, uh, you know, we had this in our own uh, learning community that is, is backward course design more is it also something like that is, you know, from the different approaches to learning, we have cognitive, we have constructive, and also behavioristic. We were thinking about, I advocated that as a co-constructive perspective, but then I was thinking like, also, it is a question that is it also behavioral? Because we are trying to guide the students' behavior towards some preferred learning outcomes. I wanted to see what your insight is, is in, in, in this regard. Uh, well, uh, I mean, is your question about is is uh, backward design does it work or is it coordinating these you know cognitive versus uh, cons constructive versus behavioral? Is it is coordinating those? Is your question? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, I, I think that uh, what that re reveals your question. Well, the, the the short answer is yes. You you can and should to the degree that you can incorporate more than just cognitive learning outcome, behavioral learning outcomes or uh, constructive or whatever. Uh, now you may need different frameworks for doing that, uh, but having multiple kinds of learning, desired learning outcomes is okay. What, what you, if when you do that, you probably though need to uh, keep in mind that, that you don't want too many major 
desired learning outcomes yet. That is to me, 10, 15, 20 is too many. Uh, I think, you know, five to seven is probably a max, uh, an optimum number of desired learning outcome, which may have sort of sub points under them, but it's sort of macro things that you want to keep your eye on and make progress towards uh, a handful, you know, a good handful, five, six, seven, whatever, but not 10, 12, 15. Uh, that becomes too many to, to, really, to really effectively uh, support and build in the activities necessary to make significant progress on and to monitor them uh, for students. So that'd be my general advice on that. You can have multiple kinds, but, but keep a lid on the number of them. Thank you. I was gonna jump in too, if I could, just as I teach a course about adult learning theory. And so I just, my head was just in this space where we have students do a project where they kind of separate out behavioral versus cognitive versus constructivist type learning theories and how they apply. And I mean, to me, the, at the end of the day, we're almost using bits and pieces of each of them when we're really getting students involved in this more well-rounded education. And so I don't know that that's an answer, just to say that I think at some level, when you use a framework like this, that isn't just a behavioral perspective or a constructivist or a cognitive perspective, it actually allows you, it gets messier, but it kind of allows you to use some of the benefits of all these different philosophies of teaching and approaches to teaching in a way that, that to me, I think is more freeing for people and we can kind of use the best of everything as opposed to just focusing on learning is a behavioral change or learning is only something that, you know, we're not concerned with their thoughts or their emotions. And so it does feel messier, but yet something that we can approach um, from lots of perspectives. And I think at the end of the day, we get a better educational outcome because we're looking at the much bigger picture, um, which kind of leads to other questions, I think that D that come in a lot around things like, like when we have values and caring and learning to learn as our goals, how do we measurably assess those things? How do we create these learning outcomes and you know look for evidence? So do you wanna to speak to that a little bit? Well, yeah, and that, that, that is a question that came up very early when I put this taxonomy out there. It says the first three, you know, we're familiar with cognitive stuff. Bloom's been having us work on that for several decades, but this, uh, this interaction on caring and learning how to learn um, how do we assess those things? And, and I have some general thoughts. I mean, I've thought about that, but I think uh, people are right. As soon as you introduce those, one of the questions that has to come up is uh, what both how do we get it to happen, but then equally important is how do we know whether it's happened? That's, your, that's the assessment piece. I think there are answers to that. I think there, we have to be creative and, and just give some thought and explore it. Um, let me just uh, just brainstorm a few of the kind, kinds of things that I've come up with in my own thinking about that. Uh, having students interact with others. Have, how would we know if students have made progress in that, in interacting in a better way? And I, and I, think, uh, I think one way to do that would be to have a questionnaire for the whole class to say, how do they feel about some of their class, especially uh, how, they, how do they feel about the interaction capabilities of their fellow students? Uh, have they gotten better over the time or how good are they at the end, by the end of it, however you want to put it. <clears throat> but uh, when you start introducing other students in the class, especially if you get classes beyond, you know, 10, 12, 15, uh, you probably can't have students react to all the other students. That is one reason for, for me to break the class up into small groups and have the course operate via small groups throughout the course. I mean, to me, that's, that has a lot of good, good reasons to do that. But one of them, and it, it allows you to do the student assessment, they don't evaluate everybody, they evaluate the people in their small group. So you've got, got them evaluating, you know, five, six, seven people, whatever. And that's, that's a feasible amount of feedback to give on people. Then, so everybody in the group evaluates themselves, they turn that into you, and then you summarize it somehow, and somehow get it back to the students if you can. Uh, but uh, both about what they learned and how well they contributed to the work of the group and those sorts of things. Uh, so to me, that, that's, that's, the, that's the direction in which I'd move for evaluating, getting the course evaluated and the students evaluated and the, and the small groups evaluated. Great, and as we move into kind of the last 10 minutes or so of our time together, there were some more specific questions that came in and um, Hillary, I think you were out there, Greenberger, you had a question as you were just talking about groups. 
um, that yours was more around kind of independent mastery of material, but also when students are working on groups. Do you want to share anything with Dee and some context for your question as well? Sure. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, Hillary Greenberger from Ithaca College Physical Therapy Department. Um, I teach in fairly large uh, large cohorts um, from 75 to 100 students. And I struggle with, so for grading purposes, mm -hmm. I have them in groups when they do projects. But my concern is whether or not they are reaching independent, ma independent mastery of the material if they're working in groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that, that is I, always a worry. I mean, um, and it's it's a worry whether you have a whole class or using small groups or not. Using how do you how do you know what, what number seventy eight and ninety eight are learning well as numbers one and two that you might have a little more contact with? And I, I, if if they're for the moment the question is are they learning the content? I think the the only answer to that is you've got to give some content assessment uh, individually. I mean that everybody takes individually. Uh, you can have them do it individually keep the paper and then have them do it <clears throat> collectively in which there's a lot of learning that goes on as I hear what you th thought you learned. And, oh, I did that too, but I, I didn't think about it. But you've got a record of what they did learn independently, at least you know, for the questions you give them or what they thought they did uh, either way. And uh, so I think you just have to give individual questionnaires uh, that you make up or they add to or, or however you want to set it up. But if you want to know how well they each individual uh, Master the material. Some you got to simplify that down because, uh, but but you can do that. Um, you just have to give them out this kind of a conventional questionnaires about it, tests about it, as well as some group things. And again, others feel free to share thoughts. Yeah. So, Hillary, were you going to jump? Do you have in? some follow up questions to that, yeah. Hillary? No, um, unfortunately, um, I you were frozen for most of your response. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I <laughs> uh, do you know, Bridget, whether you're recording that, do you know whether the, that will record the freeze or the actual? I was actually able to hear you, so I don't know. If oh, so that maybe that's something on Hillary's is. screen or yeah, whatever. Yeah, maybe it's at my end. So maybe you can get a copy of the recording from Bridget later and, and yep, just answer sure. that. Yep, I will do that. Thank you. Yeah. And that's what I was going to suggest, too, that if others want to share ideas, this is one of those oh. issues that I think is is really a big thing that we all kind of grapple with. And there's lots of different approaches and philosophies. And there's some, you know, kind of peer grading and group grading and grading on mastery and specs grading. And there's like so many different kinds of things that can be done. It's hard to, you know, I know for D to answer that in 30 seconds, but <laughs> so just to acknowledge kind of the complexity <laughs> of that question, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I think if I could paraphrase what you said in that Cliff Notes version, it was sort of needing some some level of independent evidence as well as the yep. group that you do. Um, and it kind of goes into another, I was sort of grouping together some questions that came in earlier that were looking at, especially the, the taxonomy and the integrated course design process and do, these, do, do those things change when we teach asynchronously or when we teach online or when we teach in different formats or if we teach a condensed course, like an eight week course. So, um, I mean, I certainly have thoughts on that, but Dee, if you want to just address like how it works with different formats. And... Yeah, no, I, I think uh, both of those, uh, the taxonomy and the course design, design uh, are universal in their general principles. That is, I think, uh, you know, figuring out what you want students to learn and how they're going to learn it and how you're going to know whether they learned it, how well they learned it. Those are true whether you're dealing with a six person seminar or a, a 200 student class of some sort. How you get at that, you can, you can do some things with a six person seminar that you probably can't do with a, a 200 student uh, class. But the, the challenge is the same. That is, you want to know to what degree they learned X, Y, or Z and why or why not. And so how you get at that with how much of it's questionnaire, how much of it's sort of a, a whole group discussion, I think something like that, where you can probe into their answers a little more uh, in a way you just not feasible with a 100, 200 students. Uh, but the, 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 the needs and the general direction, uh, you just have to ask them some questions uh, and to get the answers as, as focused as you can. 
Yeah, and I think I would echo that too, just that I know we all got so sick of the word pivot over the last couple of years, but I think that was the idea of having this really strong sense of your goals for the course that go beyond the content, that if we have that, that is sort of our anchoring point, and then we can shift to a smaller course, a different format, to online, to synchronous, um, because when we, I know, again, I taught at a university that has 10 week courses, so already that seems condensed to what a lot of you teach, but then sometimes we had courses that were four weeks or five weeks. So that really changes the nature of the content in terms of how much you can cover, but it really doesn't change the type of learning you want students yeah. to be doing. So, you know, for an English class, maybe you're not going to read 17 novels. Maybe you only have time to read five, but you're still, if the goals are really to explore these perspectives and to develop, you know, understandings of genres, like you still can do that with five, mm -hmm texts as opposed to 17 so the, the in, in fact on on that very point one of the things i think uh, i would often often wish more of my literature teachers teachers had done was not only teach me about certain novels but really teach me this is how you approach and study a novel no matter what it is and if i could do that with three of them in the course i could do it with any of them that i read thereafter in my life and and that would solve one and and how to pick out which novels I want to read. Uh, one of my laments in life is I go into a bookstore and they got 100 million books in there. Where do I start? <laughs> I don't have a personal plan. I'm, I have developed one since then, but I had to do it on my own. But it would be helpful to have students learn how to develop a plan for their own reading. How much of it is about personal life, how much professional life, how much of it is uh, kind of serendipitous, some of it is pre planned or whatever. But learn how to develop. Uh, a plan for what you want to read and, and what order and what's high priority and what's down the line a little bit. Uh, I think that would be a lot of help to students. I know it would be to me and would have been to me. And I, I developed it on my own eventually. But if you can help students learn how to do that and they can dialogue with each other about their plans and they can learn from each other. I think uh, sending students out with both a plan, but also knowing how to periodically update their plan for reading what they want to read and and what they want to get out of it and how much of it they want to read very carefully and how much they want to read sort of uh, for the big picture uh, would be a lot of value. Yes, and I can't help but mention that's a big focus of our Teach Students How to Learn course, which is really about, you know, we take these things for granted that they know how to read an academic article versus a textbook versus a novel. Those are different strategies. Mm -hmm. And they don't always walk in our doors knowing how to do that in the way that we expect. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I know we just have a couple more minutes. I want to be sensitive of time. So if anybody has any last minute questions, please throw those our way. Um, but I also just wanted to perhaps end with another kind of grouping of questions, which were more around you know, how this framework fits with the way things are heading nowadays rightly so, where we're really focused on equity-based practices, inclusive design. Um, we, I know, Sara, you kind of touched on that a little bit in your question as well. And I've, I've personally always found that this approach really has always been much more embracing of that and getting students even involved in the design process and yeah. focusing it around students more holistically. But um, Dee, if you want to talk a little bit about how any of that goes. Well, you did a pretty good job of summarizing. I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add to that. Uh, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the two goals you mentioned there, one is making sure we have some clear learning goals, desired learning outcomes for the course, whether they're mine or jointly developed with the students. Uh, having a set of goals is really important, but then learning, uh, helping students uh, learning, then how do we address those is, is equally important. Now, how do we set up an agenda? We'll do it for this course, but you want to be able to set up your own learning agenda for additional reading after the course and making sure that that's part of the course, helping them learn how to do that, uh, I think is important as well as just what's the content of these ideas. And I guess the other thing I actually meant to add this into what you were talking about before, but just in terms of being able to apply this to such different situations, whether it's online or a condensed course or different, yeah. you know, students with different backgrounds. Um, you know, the idea of situational factors is another big component of your process that we don't often, that's one thing I often hear from faculty yeah. as well. I've never taken that, you know, I kind of assume that I know my class is different and I have these factors, but really yeah. listing them out helps in being very intentional in the design and being able to say this is a course that could be 
hybrid or this is a course where students are coming in without, you know, they, they don't think they can do math or they have very little background in this fundamental prerequisite, which I, you know, the course was based on that they already knew how to do. So those are these situational factors that once we really put those in, in a form where we can see them, we can actually begin to address them more intentionally. Well, yeah, I think you, you put your finger right on it. Most of, most of us are generally pretty well aware whether we got a two week course or a 10 week course or 20 students or 120. Uh, but then taking time to stop and think, uh, how am I going to respond to each of those? So I can, so the course can be infected, even effective, even though it's 120 students or or whatever. They know nothing about this subject matter to begin with. Whatever the challenge, major challenges are, uh, listing those things out and say, how am I going to respond to that? Am I going to do something in the course? You may not have to do address all of them, but you should be able to address a handful of them. Uh, that's going to go a long ways towards making the course have the kind of impact you want for the students. Well, thank you, Dee. Thank you, everyone. I know we were right at the top of the hour and we are busily finishing up our, our semester and our quarter. So thanks everyone. Best of luck to you with your course design and your ongoing, hopefully you have a bit of a break over the next few weeks. Um, but again, feel free to reach out with questions and let us know. And thanks for joining us for this fairly informal chat with Dee Fink. It was a pleasure on my end. Thank Bridget for setting it up and thank the rest of you for joining in.